Hi, this is Thalia with FedArt and Creative Forces, and this is my third polymer clay video. Before we get into the clay, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about the relationship between clay and the natural world, and how we identify sculptures as objects that are not sculptures. How we can tell that my dinosaur is a dinosaur, and how we can make sure that the dinosaur I make reads as a clean dinosaur rather than a messy dinosaur. Now, in my own life, I tend to be kind of a messy dinosaur. I'm, you know, a bit sloppy with my stuff, and I don't always keep everything in separate drawers. But when I'm sculpting with clay, I try very hard to keep the different areas distinct. I'm going to make a chameleon on a background and he's camouflaging himself, there's a good reason why he wouldn't stand out. Or if we're making an abstract sculpture that's about the breakdown of boundaries, then there is a really good reason not to cleanly delineate the areas of your sculpture. If the point is that something is blending into another thing, go ahead and blend it. But if the point is not that something is blending into another thing, your sculpture is going to read as messy if parts blend into each other that don't in the natural world. So. The way that I like to address this situation when I'm working with polymer clay is to sculpt the parts separately and then connect them in a different step. So I like to sculpt a part and then bake it and then attach another part. This is completely possible with polymer clay, but not with other types of clay, like ceramic clay in particular. So in general, with clay, you can't connect dry parts to wet parts, or cured parts to uncured parts. But one of the really great things that I've found about polymer clay is that you're allowed to do this with polymer clay. It works just great. So I find that the best way to avoid squishing the face or blending the feet into the floor is to increase the number of steps and take 20 minutes in between sculpting the first part and the second part um, to cook the parts so that you're not going to squish them and then if you add too much extra clay you can just wash it off. So here you can see that I have taken a shell that I found on the beach near my house and I pressed it into a ball of polymer clay and I got um, an impression of it. There are lots of useful things in the garage and the hardware store. Many things can be used with polymer clay to make impressions. Almost anything three-dimensional in theory. Anything that's less mushy than polymer clay. This beautiful shoe is stepping on the clay, and that's actually kind of a good idea. You can get some really interesting patterns from the bottoms of your shoes. Just make sure that they're clean before you use them as stamps. It's kind of art deco. Jewelry can make a good stamp. On the left you can see the imprint that I made with a bottle of medicine. It says closed tightly to unlock, push down, and turn. And you might notice that it printed backward, and that's going to happen anytime the text is going forward. If you have raised text, the first copy will be backward, but then the second copy will be forward again because backward twice is forward. We're 
we're about to enter a time warp during which I'm going to sip the seashell. Here I'm using some water as a resist between two layers of polymer clay. You can actually make the mold and the material out of polymer clay. Everything can be polymer clay, except the hair. Here you see I'm using a belt. There are lots of things in your house that will work very well with stamps. There's the medicine bottle lid. And I'm going to demonstrate for you that the second time you take an impression of something, it will flip back to positive. The words will read forward again. Feel free to try it for yourself. It isn't always wrong if the words read backward. But it is something you want to be aware of so that the decision is intentional. <laughs> <laughs> 